Hello, everyone. Uh, we're back on air. This is Unisoft Law Professional Corporation YouTube show where I interview professionals, predominantly lawyers, and uh, usually um, we don't have the split screen. But uh, today I thought we'd have the split screen because uh, this is going to be a really fun conversation and you might want to observe the exchange. So I have the uh, inimitable uh, Ian Hu here today, um, uh, my good friend and uh, a lawyer and uh, an estates lawyer. Uh, and he's currently in Barry and he's formerly of Law Pro. And I'm uh, not going to say much more about him. Instead, I'd rather pass the floor to Ian and let him introduce himself. How you doing, Fouad? Happy to be Good. here. Thank you. Practicing uh, state's law these days. Uh, you never know what I'm going to be practicing next, I guess. But uh, that's what I'm up to. Well, that's, that's a really great introduction. It's much shorter than uh, all the other ones I had on the show. Uh, and I think it bodes well for what is to come because Ian is a really special guy and he's a man of many talents, including literary talents. I also uh, know that he studied philosophy uh, and I'm, I'm going to stop here talking in third person about you. So instead, I'm just going to address you, Ian. Uh, you studied philosophy, uh, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um sort of my first career in philosophy, I thought I was going to be a prof. And I studied a uh, master's. I was uh, halfway through my PhD, Aubert dissertation. And uh, I guess one day, you could say one day I was, uh, I was, uh, you know, going to bed and I was thinking to myself, I'm never, uh, I'm never going to be able to get a, a, uh, a decent job and make a good living. <laughs> And so uh, it finally dawned on me that, you know, less than 50% of, of PhD grads end up with a, with a tenure job in a good university. Um, and I was just like, I can't do this. So that's but wait, so you, you, you were PhD track then, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you have a, an undergrad in philosophy as well? Yeah, I did my undergrad, did my master's. Where did you go to uh, university for your undergrad? Western. Western, and you did philosophy at Western uh, in, um, uh, for your undergrad, and you got your bachelor's, and then uh, where'd you go for your master's? I did my master's at, at U of T. Uh, it's an interesting story. I wanted to do it so bad, uh, and the first time I applied to like 10 schools, all 10 rejected me. Uh, so the next time around, I, I, I applied to 20 schools. And then I got into one, which is U of T. So I went into U of T for master's. And again, for PhD, I applied to like 40 places and I had two or three offers. You know, when I went to law school, I was fairly aimless. I didn't have a direction. I didn't necessarily know uh, in the beginning what I wanted to specialize in. And you know, I, I don't think I was alone. I remember distinctly conversations uh, in the classroom are you going to do litigation or are you going to do, what did they say, solicitor's work or something like that? <laughs> and uh, almost always those conversations ended up in, well, I'm going to try both and then we'll see, right? So a lot of people were not sure about what they were going, what they were going to do. Uh, did you know what you were going to do um, in the field of philosophy when you went into the master's program? Maybe a a oh, yeah. uh, specific area or philosopher. For sure. I'm a huge fan of the existentialists, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, um, Sartre, those folks, and uh, wanted to study those guys. And in fact, one of my offers was was to, to study under a, a uh, Mirrod Westpaw, who was then a very famous Kierkegaard um, philosopher. Um, so that's what I wanted to do, that or ethics. Um, and so I ultimately did choose to go to Rice to study ethics. Rice University. In Texas, yeah. Yeah, I know. Uh, so wait, did you transfer to Rice from UFT? Um, I, no, I, I finished my master's at UFT and then I went to Rice for a PhD. Oh my God, so you did yeah. start your PhD program then. I yeah, thought you were- I was ah. four years into my PhD program, 10 years in philosophy. 
Oh my God, this is, this is getting better and better. So fascinating. Uh, tell me, what is Kierkegaard all about? And I'm, sh I'm sure I'm bru bru butchering uh, the pronunciation of his name, just like as I'm usually butcher pronunciation of names. Well, you know, he's Danish. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think I'm going to be able to pronounce it properly either. But um, he, I like him a lot because he's, uh, I think he has a deep understanding about, about what it means to, to have faith or, or to be religious. And, and for him, it's, he, 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 the main thing that he says is, if you're going to have faith, in a God, you have to, and if it's, and if you're going to take it seriously, you have to have doubt. Anyone has to have doubt to believe in someone that you don't see and someone that doesn't communicate with you in, in the typical ways and, and someone that supposedly is looking after your best interests in a world where there's evil. To have all of this, you got to have doubt. And the, and the cool thing about faith is that even though you have doubt, you still believe. That's what makes it faith. In other words, um, it, it would be naive to, to say, I don't have any doubt that, that God exists and, and I have faith. I have complete faith. That just doesn't make sense for Kierkegaard. Um, and, and I agree with that. So that's, that's one thing that, that really struck with me. And one of his favorite phrases is subjectivity is truth which I also uh, deeply agree with, namely to say, which, you know, namely that what counts is, is your relationship with God, or to put it in another way, your relationship with people, your relationship mm -hmm. with things, and your relationship with the world. And you got to understand that first before you, uh, you go and think about other things. Does it mean that the truth is how I see the world, not how... Um someone purporting to be an objective observer is telling me uh, to see the world. Um, it, that's exactly what it means. That's deep. And uh, how do we apply that in, uh, in law? I think, I think law, of course, is grounded in philosophy, right? Yeah. To start. I think, yeah. I think the answer to that is, is subjectivity is truth it means it's, it's true for you and and nothing else counts when you're talking about yourself it just it just doesn't and if the world treats you in a certain way and 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 let's say you know we we like to think about objective truth right especially we in do we, we do very yeah. much what about the reasonable person standard yeah i mean what he says um is, isn't a philosophy of law you know it's a philosophy of living uh for mm -hmm. for each of us as individuals Mm -hmm. it's a, I think of it as advice on living, right? Mm -hmm. Subjectivity is truth. It means you have to absorb things uh, and, and understand that whatever someone's relationship is with you, um, it's, it's up to you to dictate that. It's up to you to define, to think about it, to understand it, to conceptualize it. That is, that's your relationship and yours alone. So, for example, your relationship with my relationship with you, Pulat, my relationship with God, my relationship with, with, um, with my wife, those are one-on-one -on -one relationships, which nobody can, can define and, and nobody can conceptualize other than me. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's, that's what I take from Kierkegaard. Is there a conflict between this uh, system of beliefs and the, the legal system, which is always trying to impose an objective standard on the members of society, such as the reasonable person standard, such as a code of, of rules. Yeah. So the, the simplest example is the criminal code. Well, I think it's, it's exactly this kind of thinking that, that's, that led from Kierkegaard to Hegel. Hegel was, was a huge, um, um, he's essentially the, the, uh, the anti-Kierkegaard. And, and he looked at Kierkegaard with the same questions that you had. And he said, look, there's obviously some objective truth out there. That, or intersubjectivity is what Hegel calls it, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the intersubjectivity that, 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 that comes into play. And, mm -hmm. and another thing that Hegel says is there's, there's an interplay between these two ways of living, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, on the one hand, we all understand as individuals, these are unique relationships that we, we have mm -hmm. and that only mm -hmm. we understand. Nobody can go into our heads. Right. But on the other hand, it's also clear there are many other individuals who are of the exact same mindset and right. that's intersubjectivity 
And so in this mm -hmm. intersubjective world is how we, you know, we come to create civilization. Ian, did you read uh, a book called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman? Yes. All right. So that's, that makes it easier. Um, according to Daniel Kahneman, we are essentially error uh, machines. All we do is make mistakes. Yeah. We're generally wrong about our perception of, of reality. We are uh, saddled with deep biases. And uh, it's not just commonly known biases, right? And especially, for example, biases that uh, people talk about a lot now with respect to race and other things. It's, it's just biases that are deep-seated and that everybody has. Biases about um, experts, biases about uh, how well, uh, uh, um, our, how good our skills are about something, right? A lot of biases. And according to Kahneman, and of course he's backing up his views with really powerful research and the Nobel Prize. According to Kahneman, we're not to be trusted, basically, no. right? Don't, don't yeah. put us at, at, at Starship Enterprises controls, right? We're not Captain Kirk's. Yeah, I say that to litigators uh, in regards to the anchoring effect, right? Which is the, someone throws a number at you and that number is in your head and, and you're stuck with that number. So if you want to settle something for, you know, a million dollars and you say to the opposing lawyer, I want to settle this for two million, the opposing lawyer is just going to say, whatever number he's thinking of next is going to be based on that two million. And so you're going to get to your one million. But if, you are, if your first number is 1.1 million, <laughs> Your lawyer, the lawyer's next number is based on that, and he's going to not come potentially as high. That's just the way it works for anchoring effect. Um, no, so, so it's true. Um, our, our, our perceptions and, and are, are colored by, by these physical brains we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you'll leave it at that, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is fascinating. You know, I, I looked at your Twitter profile, and I'm just going to pull it up here to refresh my memory. And I, I recommend everyone, by the way, to uh, uh, follow uh, Ian on Twitter. Um, I'm just going to look it up here real quick. We were talking about biases, and uh, I thought of your uh, Twitter bio. Uh, lawyer. EDI and legal tech consultant. So if I understand it correctly, EDI is equity, diversity, and inclusion. Yes. Yes. So this is really directly relevant to our discussion about biases now. And I'm always interested in this topic. This is a really important topic today. And recently uh, there were some Twitter um, uh, dramas about uh, EDI consultants that charged millions of dollars, charged the US government millions of dollars to uh, educate federal employees about bias. And uh, uh, in connection with racial bias, of course, I don't know if you noticed those, but we all probably can guess that there is an EDI consultancy industry right now. But yes. the curious thing about those consultants is that they appear to be not racialized. By the way, what is racialized, Ian? Racialized, uh, um, I define racialized as, as um, self-identifying yourself um, in, in a group that, that's uh, racially discriminated historically. Mm -hmm. So racialized then is a subjective uh, uh, property? Um, I, th I think most people consider it to be subjective in the sense that you have to identify yourself and put yourself in that, in that group. There, right. there might be people, for example, I consider Chinese or myself to be racialized, um, but that doesn't mean that someone else might consider themselves to be racialized. Right, right. Th this is interesting. But are people who uh, um, belong to groups that have not been historically discriminated against allowed or can reasonably consider themselves racialized. Exactly. I, I remember, I remember I some, some, yeah. yeah, racialized only, it, it only applies to the historical treatment and, and frankly, the present treatment of, of, of certain groups. Absolutely. So yeah. uh, you see how we slowly are uh, changing the, the topic into EDI and uh, 
we are not charging fifteen thousand dollars for this video. <laughs> I'm not sure if our viewers can claim the EDI credit from the Law Society. I think that has to be accredited. But uh, regardless of uh, EDI or CPD credits, I think this is a really fascinating. And you don't, dear viewers, you don't get to listen to people like Ian explain these things very often. So please listen carefully. This is really interesting stuff. Now. Um, Equity, uh, diversity, and inclusion, uh, of course, is a, it's a movement. Can we say it's a movement or is it a policy? What is a better way to describe yeah, it? No, I, I, think, I agree with you. I think it is a movement. Um, it's clear and it's becoming an industry. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So it's a movement and uh, we, I don't think that this movement is, is recent. I think this movement started at least when the civil rights movement in America began. Would you say that? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't just uh, in America, it was throughout the world in, in the 60s. Yeah. Right. So this is, by the way, my next question. When we talk about historic discrimination and we talk about defining racialized groups based on that factor, are we geographically limiting this definition? Is it the North American concept or maybe uh, Western European con concept or uh, does this concept exist outside of the Western world? You know, that, that's a terrific question. And I got to say, you're, you're uh, spreading, you're, uh, you're at, the, at the edges of my, of my knowledge, Pruitt. Um, and We're pushing the envelope here. We are. Um, because look, we, 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 you and I and, and people watching this probably live in North America, right? This is the right. world that we know. But we all, but there's no question, um, you know, I went to China a couple of years ago where, and that's where I, where I was born. Um, and it's clear that there's, there's, there are racialized people there too. And, and of course, racial, being racialized depends on uh, the country that you're in. If you're Chinese in China, you, you're not historically discriminated against, right? Mm -hmm. You might look at um, uh, other, other native uh, uh, peoples in China who are, mm -hmm. um, or people of other groups, and same thing in India, right? If you're and if you're from India, then and you're an Indian person, then you're not discriminated against. But if you're if you're not re historically discriminated, but if you come to North America, I mm -hmm. think you can count yourself as racialized. So right. um, that that's it depends, of course, on on the context. Right. Here's another question uh, about the global, potentially global nature of this movement. It's, it's an inherently Western movement, wouldn't you agree? It is, it is. And it, it is informed by uh, thought of predominantly Western, albeit perhaps racialized, not, not exclusively, but racialized thinkers, yet, think Western, yet Western thinkers. It's, it's Western, and especially right now, it's powered by the Black Lives Matter movement. Right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's the true um, you know, push behind it. The, the roots of racism and systemic racism that, that, systemic racism that we are uh, addressing and fighting uh, today in North America are essentially in uh, the spread of Western countries, into other civilizations where they brought by force or by other form of coercion or uh, through imbalance of power where they brought uh, people from other civilizations into their own lands and uh, uh, settled them with fewer rights, with undignified status, uh, uh, as essentially people who were discriminated uh, against from the start. So essentially systemic racism in America and in Canada is a product of Western hegemony, global hegemony. Would you agree with that this statement? Yeah, it, it's, it's certainly a, a, an interesting way to look at it. I mean, I mean, slavery is, is I think the, the, yes, I mean, there's, there's the, um, there's the, uh, you know, the foreigner coming into the native land and displacing the, the natives, right? That's, that's the story right. you're telling. But there's also slavery, which is, which is um, bringing over black people from Africa and enslaving them. 
And I think right. that is, 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 is just as hard to, to swallow. America has a double whammy, right? Mm -hmm. we've, got, uh, um, the, we've got the foreigner coming into the native, native lands and displacing the, the you know, people that live here, the indigenous. Right. And you've got, you've got slavery, which is an, an, a, a, an incredible, um, unacceptable uh, way of living that was around for decades, many, many decades, and which built America. Uh, you know, Thomas Piketty says, uh, does an analysis of this in his book, Capital in the 21st Century. And he basically yeah, says, look, you want to know one of the reasons why America built so, so much wealth so quickly? This is how. This is why. And, and, and when we talk about systemic racism and, and its historical roots, right, the, the, there's violence, there's economic inequality, and so on. Um, that, in the, in the, you know, 100, 200 years since then, um, I think the problem now, the real problem now, is the growing inequality. For me, when it, for me, the economic inequality is is or is the is a real problem, um, and 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 because I ask myself, what would it be like if everyone had had um, equal wealth, equal income? Let's just hypothetically think like that, right? Mm -hmm. Or if there's the same number of of people in, in this income bracket and, and this this bracket. In, in the various racialized groups. Mm -hmm. I think it would be hard to say that there's a problem then, right? Mm -hmm. Right, um, I understand. Yeah, I think that that's the main issue. But yes, of course, there's the political problem. There's no political power. There's, there's um, the violence that's happening now and before. There's the fact that, you know, more black people are incarcerated now than, than any other race or, or racialized group and so on. And those. Those are huge problems too, but I would love to see the economic problems solved in, a, in, a, in education, and I feel like that those are the are the um, would would put a big solve on on things. Mm -hmm. I see. Interesting. What would Kierkegaard say about uh, today and the systemic racism in North America today? You know, um, one of the things that occurred to me when I when I read Piketty. And and I can't believe it took me 43 years to understand this. <laughs> I'm 42 years old. Now. Um, is uh, philosophy and 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 literature and writing takes place in certain eras, and takes place and it's typically written by people in certain income and wealth brackets. Mm -hmm. And so it may not be surprising that they don't have anything to say about such things, because they were not in the discriminated or, or uh, uh, suffering classes. You know, they, 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 were, they weren't thinking about those things. Um, and so Kierkegaard, I don't think he, he would have much to say, except that he did value intersubjectivity. And so I would say, how are you going to connect uh, um, authentically with people if you're, you have all this other stuff that's uh, standing in the way? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Ian, who is your least favorite philosopher? <laughs> well, I'm not a huge fan of the contemporary analytic philosophers um, for the reason that there's a lot of uh, nitpicking over the language and logic. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes you get lost between semantics and meaning. Um, so I, I, uh, I don't find that, and I don't find that the questions they ask about um, language and intentionality and so on, I have, have a big practical role to play in how we live our lives. And so that's why I like the existentialists. They give you a formula to live your life. The formula, by the way, is simple uh, uh, for Kierkegaard. Your soul is infinite. You live in a finite world. But because you are undefined, you can be anything you want at any time. That's what Kierkegaard says. That's what Sartre says, but in a different way. That's what Nietzsche says when he says, uh, you know, the, um, uh, what is it? Life has no meaning or something. Mm -hmm. uh, 
that's what they all say. And it gives you the freedom then to, to create yourself. Anytime. Isn't that, isn't that very scary? Yes. Well, I know, I know you worked, I know you worked at Lob Pro. Speaking of scary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I feel like Kierkegaard and Sartre and Nietzsche, uh, they had a lot of influence on our society, on the Western civilization. And I feel like that's what we're left with after we leave our parents' house, is this, uh, is this huge space that uh, the society tells us to fill with our achievements, with our identity, with uh, our contributions. And I think it's very much in line with what uh, with the philosophies that you have just described. Yeah, think about what? how, how yeah. we. Sorry, Pulet. I know go you're ahead. about to go on an amazing thread there. I shouldn't <laughs> have interrupted you. Uh, I was just going to say, look. Um, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, um, think about how people tend to identi identify themselves. Right? Who am I? Well, who are my favorite? Uh, who are my favorite uh, musicians? Right? What do I like to listen to? What are my favorite movies? What do I like to wear? What's my, what, what car do I like? Uh, what do I like to, where do I want to live? Are those really questions that give us meaning? Are those really questions that identify you as a human being? But, and I would say the answer is no, but they are identifiers in terms of where you are in society. They are identifiers in terms of your socioeconomic class, in terms of what, you know, the, the, where you stand um, in the world and how mm -hmm. you spend your money in the world. Mm -hmm. That's what mm -hmm. they identify. Mm -hmm. Right. But that's not what Kierkegaard was talking about when he said, uh, go and fill this void and uh, define yourself. And uh, it's, what matters is your subjective perception. That's not what he uh, necessarily had in mind. He didn't have a uh, Mercedes in mind or a BMW or, you know, Hugo Boss uh, shoes or, or something like that, right? Or, or even, you know, how many lawyers work at your firm or... Exactly. Or, or even your own job. Your yeah, job or, how, or how many Supreme Court cases you argued, right? And things like that. But, but we are people. We are, peop we are people of the Kahneman um, uh, theory of the Kahneman world, where people with our own biases and weaknesses, and with all these Kahneman biases or Kahneman described biases and weaknesses, when people face the expectation to define themselves, do you think they follow the path of least resistance? Which by the way, uh, in reality may turn out to be the path of huge effort and, uh, and, and addiction and, and, and yeah. trauma, but you know what I mean. Yeah, so the path of least resistance just means it's, it's the path that society puts us into, right? In other words, it is extremely hard to do, to do something else, right? Um, it is what our parents expect of us, what our neighbors expect of us our friends, our coworkers. You know, if you, if you go to university, if you do well in university, um, all your friends are going to have similar um, desires, right? They wanna to go to law school, they wanna build wealth, they wanna have high income. Uh, or to put it another way, they wanna go on great vacations and stick them on Instagram, right? Mm -hmm. They wanna they put their kids in private school. Mm -hmm. um, all of this is, is what is expected of whatever social economic standing where we, we happen to be in. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, the music that we listen to, what society celebrates. And on top of that, what, what, the, what, what the world and governments spend, spend money on. You know, I, I just wrote a post on Slaw the other day. Um, we spend money on big buildings in downtown. We spend money on Starbucks. Um, we spend money on, on Netflix. And we spend um, money on the police, and we spend very, very little on the courts. So, so where does justice lie? 
uh, in society's uh, value system. If you just looked at the budget of any government mm-hmm. and you looked at how much goes to defense and how much goes to, goes to business and, and so on and how much goes to justice, uh, <laughs> you'll see that justice doesn't take a huge, um, huge role, right? In other words, don't, don't think, you don't need to think and ask yourself um, or, or, or guess how important something is to you. You look at where you spend your money on. Right. And I think people and I think that's true of the government. It's true of ourselves, too. Um, And if you look at your own finances and you think, uh, oh, I spend wisely, you know, I spend only on things that I need. But then you you sit down and you do an analysis of the last 12 months of your spending life and you have spent half your money on food and clothes and shoes. Um, You need to think then about what about what your perception of yourself is and what the reality is. Mm-hmm. So um, I don't know where I was heading with that. But, but yeah. No, no, I understand. Uh, it's, it's really good stuff. So basically uh, what you're saying is uh, power entails responsibility. Uh, uh, under Kier- Kierkegaard, we have the power to define ourselves, but we should not forget the responsibility of doing it uh, de- in a decent way, right? You, um, you want to do it, um, exactly. You want to do it um, intentionally. If you're going to go on Deliberately, law, yeah. Deliberately, exactly. If you're going to spend money on this and that, if you're going to spend your time doing things, it's something right. that you have chosen to do, that you are taking responsibility to do, right? Mm-hmm. If instead you're just going with, with the flow and you're doing it because... This puts food on your table and so on. Well, there are many ways to put food on your table. This is the path that you chose, right? And if you don't do that, then, then you're just, um, according to the existentialists, you're, you're not living a life with, with, with true meaning and authenticity. Yes, and every path and every life has an end. And the older we get, the more we think about uh, uh, the end of that road. Sure. Uh, is it is it uh, fair to say that in your practice as an estates lawyer, you deal with end of life a lot? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we deal with end of life and we deal with the repercussions, right? Well, one thing that 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 I've I've been realizing as I do this is, um, you know what you know what what stops what what prevents estate litigation. It's not a good will. <laughs> a well-written will doesn't do the trick. Uh-huh. A good family prevents estate litigation, right? Mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. law, the law is the law. Whatever. But it, you could have a terrible will, but nobody would, nobody would litigate it if the family gets along. Yes. You know. Yes. <laughs> it's yeah. and families get along badly in so many ways. It reminds me. Oh, what's that book? Is it Dickens? Every family is, is the same, but breaks no, down. No, no, no. The, the Anna Karenina, Tolstoy. Is that that's Karenina? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is Tolstoy. I'm it's, glad it's, I asked you. It's Russian. You know. It's Russian. Yeah. <laughs> what a great beginning to a, to a book, by the way. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's pretty amazing. So uh, families are all alike. Unhappy families. Are yes, their own happy way. families are all alike, and happy families are all uh, unhappy in their own way. Yes. Yeah, Tolstoy is my favorite writer. Oh, okay. Yeah, Tolstoy is my favorite writer, and uh, we can talk about literature in our second interview, which I hope we will have. <laughs> uh, but I'm really curious to hear more about your estate practice uh, and about uh, you already dropped a really powerful insight there. It's it's really powerful, and I relate to it as a litigator. I'm not an estates litigator. I'm a commercial litigator, and yeah. I, I totally agree with the sentiment that somehow people have this misconception that well-drafted contracts somehow stop litigators from commencing claims. <laughs> you know, uh, every, almost everything is arguable. Well-drafted contracts... Uh, definitely affect litigation strategy, uh, but um, and they can definitely uh, uh, reduce chances of litigation. And I, I can say that 
litigation is so messy because unfortunately lawyers don't draft contracts uh, well enough, uh, often enough. Uh, and, but uh, uh, even with the perfectly drafted contracts, lawyers still find points to argue. Uh, if it's not a point of, of fact, it's going to be a point of law, right? And it's interesting how the most interesting cases are about law discovered post factum. <laughs> When uh, parties enter into a transaction, everybody th thought that law was X. And then the Court of Appeals says, oh, no, the law is Y. <laughs> and that's why you win, yeah. right? So law is really mind-boggling this way. And I'm really uh, thankful for that point that good families don't litigate over states. Uh, I really look forward to more insights like this, uh, if you could share about your estates practice. Yeah, you know, the longer I do estates, the more... You know, every practice here has super interesting things that boggle the mind, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll tell you one uh, just interesting thing that I've, been, that, that I've done recently. The public guardian and trustee, you know, they, they have a duty right, to the public. And so one of the things they do is when they get reports that someone is potentially incapable of managing their finances, or right? Incapable of managing themselves, um, they have to investigate. And, and sometimes they do an investigation and they find that, you know, they think that someone is, has no capacity, right? So they're going to start an application to take over this person's finances and this person's um, uh, ability to take care of, of him or herself, mm -hmm. which is huge, right? right the government right, right. is going to step in and take over your life. Isn't that a scary thought? The PGT can do that. And so um, I, one of the things they have to do is they have to look for a lawyer for that person if that person can't, can't do it. So I got a call from the PGT and, and I did, the, did a case. And it's funny because this person had, had no, no money, okay? Or had very little money is how I would put it. And the funny thing is this, if I, if I won, then my client is deemed capable and my client goes and, and lives their life, okay? And disappears, hopefully. And my client, uh, I, I will send my client a bill and I won't get paid in all likelihood, right? Right. If I lose, if I lose, the PGT seizes the assets and pays off the debts of which one of them is my bill. So it's a really strange situation. Here I was oh. fighting for the capacity for my client and my self-interest in this case would be to lose, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a strange, strange situation for a lawyer to be in. You know? Maybe not so strange, uh, maybe in, on these particular facts, but Consider contingency fees, for example, right? Uh, where lawyers have their own uh, financial interest in the outcome of the case. Arguably, it's the opposite of your situation. Yes, yes. Right, but... And I, right, I was a but, lawyer for a long time, so yeah. I'm familiar with yeah, that. exactly. You're, you're a personal injury lawyer, right? Yeah. Okay, so, uh, but consider this. It can turn into, the, uh, into uh, something similar to your situation very quickly, where, for example... A lawyer takes on too much risk, more risk than advisable, and then loses. Exactly. Right? Instead of accepting, accepting a, a reasonable settlement offer. Yes. Right? And, and that gets messy now because of after the event insurance. So if the lawyer is insured, oh, yeah. the lawyer loses, the lawyer can collect the insurance. But if the, <laughs> if the lawyer... Um, tries to win or tries to settle for a very small amount that doesn't mm -hmm. cover the disbursements, then the lawyer has actually lost, even though the mm -hmm. client has not. Wow. Interesting. Well, this is really fascinating stuff. And I think it uh, helps that you uh, have an ethics background and, and the philosophy background and every, every story you tell, it keeps taking me back to Kierkegaard and how, 
Uh, we are responsible for our subjective perception of the reality, right? Because yes. when you said that uh, this old man, or I'm not sure how old he is, but anyway, or this person, if it's a man or a woman, I don't even know. So when this person uh, wins, that person is free to go. Yeah. And that person becomes basically a Kirk guardian person. Yeah. Free, free to define their own uh, reality. Yes. But do they have the ability to do so? Or are they... Uh, well, that's, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, we have certain wide freedoms up to a point, you know? Um, but let me say, we have the freedom to go into as much depth as we want. Right? Mm -hmm. it does, the state can't interfere with that. Right now, if you declare bankruptcy, fine, and then the state comes in. But, mm -hmm. but there's a difference between capacity and 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 freedom, right? If you have, uh, if you lack capacity, um, then the the state will come in and, and and take your stuff. But but if you have capacity, you're free to do as many stupid things as you want. Um, so long as it's not within the bounds of the rules, within the bounds of, of, of law. Okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so the state really is just concerned about capacity, not about doing stupid things. Uh, mm -hmm. At least in this instance, the PGT is concerned about just capacity. Mm -hmm. So when you say the PGT is concerned about capacity, what you mean also is that PGT is concerned about preventing exploitation uh, by uh, people with more capacity of people with less capacity. Exactly. The, the state, I guess what we're really asking is, is uh, to what extent does the state uh, protect these vulnerable people, right? right. And, then, and then when you think about that, you have to ask, well, how hard and how often should the state be looking for vulnerable people? And then you get into what defines a vulnerable person because if, they, if that's a broad definition, it covers you and me, that would upset us, right? So it's a very difficult line to, to throw. Right. And it may affect our ability to work. Uh, it will affect our reputation. It will affect our ability to get clients or to uh, get instructions from clients. Uh, is it fair to say that PGT uh, is like children's aid for, uh, for adults? For adults, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And children's aid, I think, of course, is very engaged and pretty much on top of protecting children sometimes they are accused of doing it too aggressively yeah children are children are, are vulnerable by definition exactly minors so it, the pgt has a harder harder job to do um because they have to assess who who's vulnerable mm -hmm. and, and and doing that they're looking at medical reports and community reports and, and all that kind of mm -hmm. thing uh, speaking of how, how much money society spends on what things, how well funded is PGT? I have no idea. I have no idea. You don't know? But, but, I, uh, but I would say with all, all justice related things, probably not as well funded as they could be. <laughs> yeah. How is life in Barrie, by the way? I'm looking at this beautiful background. It's just, I, I'm so jealous. This Thanks, is my Bullitt. background. <laughs> Thanks, Bullet. Well, for your viewers, uh, my property is probably the same price as, as your property or anyone else's property, except that I'm in a low environment, right? <laughs> your property is probably the same price as my wall right here. <laughs> yeah, or less. <laughs> Actually, I'm sure it's less than Toronto, uh, Toronto uh, properties. Um, that's why I moved out here. You know, um, the, the quality standard of living is, is, is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't have to be stressed over your finances, even though you may not make as much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is the absolute best thing about living in Barrie, specifically in Barrie? Uh, well, for, for, for us, it, it's, um, it's the outdoors. Uh, so I, I, uh, it's a very winter, Canadian I, thing to say. <laughs> yeah, man, dude. In, in the winter, I snowboard. Um, and I, 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 Hardwood Hills, where they do cross-country skiing, is 15 minutes away. I do that. I can cross country ski on, on the lake downtown, which is 10 minutes away when it ice is over, you know, um, I can go mountain biking, you know, 10 minutes away that way. Uh, and I, I've got space where my kids can grow up 
and 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 our neighbor we get along with our neighbors probably because they're farther away <laughs> we're not <laughs> we're not all squished together <laughs> yeah. um i don't you know, know my neighbors names yeah um and so i think that that those are pluses you know some of the minuses um it's you know they're you know, there isn't as much diversity out here. Um, but at the same time, there isn't as much tension because there, there's less diversity. So, you know, there's pluses and minuses, but I, I would like to give my, my, my children exposure to every aspect of life, which is why we travel and, and why, you know, we volunteer and do things. But um, there's pluses and minuses. For, for me, the, the huge plus is, is just being able to live um, uh, a less stressful life. As someone with a really wide and broad life experience, both academically and professionally, what is one advice that you want to give to, uh, let's say, a junior lawyer? Um, I think you have to think about, about what you want to do in life. And, and, and I don't mean now, but I mean what, what you want to achieve. Do you want to achieve financial independence? If so, then you got to start educating yourself and taking steps toward that. Do you want to become a partner? If you really want to become a partner, you need to take steps toward that. And that doesn't mean showing up to work every day uh, from nine to five or nine to nine and doing a good job. That means talking to partners, figuring out what they do, asking them what it takes to get there and, and achieving it. So you have, to find, you have to set these goals and then you have to find out how to achieve those goals and then you got to do them every single day. And doing something every day is hard. Um, if you want to be a rainmaker, you're probably going to be having lunch uh, every day with, with different lawyers or people in the community. You're probably writing emails um, every day. You're probably thinking about marketing and, and rainmaking every single day. And that is hard to do. If you want to, and that's true of, of, I think, everything. If you want to be, build wealth, then you have to be frugal every day, which means you're not spending time on Amazon.com or Amazon.ca. You're not, uh, you know, um, going shopping when you're bored. You're going to do something else that, that takes less money or, or that's less tempting, which means you're not on Instagram and you're not on Facebook and, and so on. You have to resist those things every day at every moment. Mm -hmm. And you have to find habits that support that goal. If your goal is to be healthy, that means that you're going to the supermarket every day and you're buying, uh, and you're, and you're make, you're cooking your own foods every day. And you're not going out. All of these things have, have require commitment on, on a second to second basis. <laughs> and it's, and God knows it's extremely hard to do all of them. Right. Cause I want to do that. I want to be healthy. I want to, I want to be financially independent, which is why I'm using these as examples, you know. Um, but guess what? If at the, at the same time I want to be a rainmaker and I'm taking people out to lunch every day or out to dinner every day, well, I'm not cooking for myself on those meals, right? So it's going to be hard for me to wash my weight. So some trade-off has to be done here. But, but I think the, the goal is, the, the key thing is to uh, understand your goals, uh, what the trade-offs are, accept those trade-offs and, and go, go for it. Malcolm Gladwell's uh, has a podcast, which he, he has one episode, which he calls the, his 12 rules of life, you know, named after, um, uh, I forget his name. Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson. And Gladwell says in his podcast, he only has one rule of life. And his one rule is to be disagreeable. In other words, not to let other people's opinions um, or other people's values um, um, infringe on your values. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Conflict is bound to happen, but you will reap the rewards. Yeah. Thank you, Ian, for this deep, fascinating conversation. I haven't had a conversation like that in a long time. Uh, I you. hope we can do this again. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's amazing. Thank you very much, Boyd. I hope people enjoy this. I'm sure they will. Someone will. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. All the best. Welcome. You too.